Hey everyone, this is Francis Caballo with Social Media Just for Writers, and I have Chris Wow with me today, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about him. Chris is the creator of Build Your Brand Academy, which offers training and resources for authors who want to build their online platform, grow their influence, and get more people to read their books. Isn't that what we all want? Chris has been a working member of the media for more than 30 years with professional experience in magazines, newspapers, radio, radio broadcasting, and digital media. He has worked with numerous national media brands in a variety of roles, including editorial, email list management, and social media. He is currently editor-at-large for Family Fiction, an online magazine that provides news and author interviews for readers of, of Christian Magazine. So welcome, Chris. It's so wonderful to have you on the show. We, Thank you, Francis. Chris and I met on Twitter. Mm -hmm. And then along the way, you wrote a fabulous blog post for my blog, and I thank you for that. Mm -hmm. And I finally was able to get him on the show. So I'm really happy about that. So you see, we have a few people here, quite a few people actually here. So I'm going to ask you if you would write in the chat box your name, and where you are from geographically. And if you could do that now, I'll take just a few seconds out of the broadcast to just get to know who you are and where you're from. So I will wait a few seconds. Oh, Mike Sano's here from Tampa, Florida. Diane from, where's that? Booney Lake, Washington. And Devin, Devin's from the central coast of California. I used to live in the central coast of California. And we have Pam from Charlottesville, Virginia. We don't have our typical representation yet. Well, here's some more. Um, Patty from Denver, Colorado. Cynthia's from Redwood City. Lori's from Walla Walla, Washington. And we have uh, John Bond from West Deptford. Stepford, New Jersey. And hi, Francis. Yeah, thanks for the shout out. Of course, Mike. I always love hearing hearing from you and seeing you at one of these webinars. We typically have a couple of people from Canada and one from Europe, but uh, maybe they'll come. They'll arrive later. So welcome everybody, and I'm so glad that you're here today. My. Uh, well, I keep thinking of Mike Sano because he always comes to my webinars and I so appreciate it. And we met on Twitter too, which is like I met Chris on Twitter. And so, but we're going to focus on Chris now and I have some questions for him. And you can also ask your questions. I will pepper Chris with the questions throughout the broadcast. And let's get this on the road. So, Chris, why don't you start by sharing your own media experience with all of us? All right, Francis. Uh, I... I started out young. I was in uh, junior high or high school. I was writing for, uh, you know, of course, like the school newspaper, the church newsletter, but also the local newspaper. And then by the time I was in college, I was writing for national magazines. And then uh, a few years later, uh, as I was, you know, I was doing some work in radio, I was one of the magazines that I was a regular freelancer for offered me an editorial position and so I moved to Tennessee to be the editor of the magazine and then in the uh, in, so that's 25 years ago about and so in the 25 years since um, I've worked at I think about three different media companies that cover dozens of different brands so I've worked at a number of magazines and website brands over that time and so in, so in the 30 years total you know I've worked in radio and podcasting and digital brands and magazines and newspapers and um, uh, I don't really know how to do anything else. Yeah you, you and I have some um, similar experiences. I worked for a local newspaper, I mm -hmm. worked for a regional magazine and then I was the editor for a magazine for a national nonprofit. Okay. So we both have this background in the media. Mm -hmm. So my next question is, you know, I've been an I'm an author too, and I've tried to get local media attention and I know that it's not easy. So isn't it kind of difficult for authors to get media attention for their books? 
the sh the short answer is that anyone can do it. I am a firm believer that anyone with the right email to the right person can get scheduled for an interview. However, that you know that is the right you know the right email to the right person. So it's not enough to just want the media coverage. You have to do some due diligence, and you have to follow through. But that said. I, I firmly believe that any author can find a media outlet somewhere that talks to the right audience and can start that conversation to get media coverage. So let's say I wrote a romance book mm -hmm. and I want to get local media attention. Whom would I contact? Okay, if you are a romance author, uh, first of all, your pitch would not be, I'm a romance author. Your pitch would be some topic that springs out of your writing. So you would have a nonfiction topic that you're going to pitch. Then you find media that talks to your target audience, people that you think would be interested, and whether that's local media or niche media, and then you would just look for the decision maker. That decision maker could be, you know, if you look in the staff box, if you look on the website, if you watch the credits or listen to the credits, they will usually tell you if there is a segment producer or if there is a department editor. Uh, maybe you talk to the reporter, maybe you talk to the host. Uh, it depends on the size of the outlet. So who you talk to will change from place to place, but it really comes down to if you need to find the, the outlet that talks to your audience and then find the decision maker, the person who would decide this is the editorial coverage that we do. This, these are the people we're going to talk to. And so in your example where you said local media, uh, a lot of times it would be there's going to be maybe a beat reporter. So you would go to, if you're thinking of like a local newspaper, there might be somebody that has a column and they might have the autonomy to put in their column people that they think are interesting. So you may just go to that columnist directly. And a lot of times, uh, if it's a blog or a newspaper, they will actually, you know, the byline of the article that tells you who wrote it will also tell you their email address or how to contact them directly. And so, you know, you can either ask them directly, hey, you know, do I, is it okay to pitch you? Are you the person? Or when in doubt, find the front desk, you know, whether it's the info email address or if there's a phone number to the front desk and just ask, who do I pitch to? Where do I send? Uh, publicity pitches at this outlet. So, um, press releases, are they helpful? Hmm, uh, the sh short answer is not that often. Uh, press release, when people think of press releases, they usually think of like a rock I'm going to throw through a window, and so I'm just going to randomly throw this rock through a bunch of windows and hope something catches. To the extent that that may have used to work in the old days, it doesn't really work like that anymore. Mm -hmm. um, what you would be doing is send, and so again, coming to your example, if you're a romance author, you want to be in the local media, you're going to talk to a specific person. You might have a press release as part of your press materials that you can refer to or maybe attach. I usually say don't send attachments. I usually say it just send an email, say who you are, why you have an interesting topic for that audience, you know, what is your angle, what is the unique thing that makes this an interesting interview. But your press, you, you may have a press release because it's part of your media materials that you can then say, you know, here's a link to my press kit, here's a link to a press release, you know, so it would be part of your support materials for your pitch, the press release would not be the pitch itself. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah, it does, it does. It is. Um, I once sent a press release to a specific uh, reporter with a copy of my book. Mm -hmm. And so when there was an article related to my topic, that's when she called me and she interviewed okay. me. And that's how I got in the media. Right. Yeah, if the press release is part of a larger conversation, for a lot of people, they just think, I'm going to just send the press release cold. But if, if it's if there's context, you know, if I, in the media, receive a press release, if I know who it's from, is completely, it completely changes the conversation. So if we're thinking of you're starting cold, they don't know you, they've never heard of you, 
that press release will probably get ignored, but if it's if if you've already made some kind of introduction or in your case you said, okay, I sent it with the book, well that also changes it because now I'm looking at a book and so it gives it gives me context and it also make, it makes it stand out. Whereas a lot of people think of the press releases, it's just this one page thing. I and and most of them are poorly written anyway, so they don't you know they don't lead with the interesting things. They start with the most boring part of the pitch. So you get this thing. It's from somebody that you you know me as the media. I'm fielding information from dozens of people all you know at a time, all day long, all week long, all month long. So your piece is just part of a stream. So anything that makes it stand out. A personal email, a personal letter, in your case, a book. You know, if you can send it with something, anything that makes it stand out from the other dozen or thirty or fifty things where somebody wanted me to figure out why this was interesting. The more that you can help them understand why it is interesting, the better it is for everybody. Yeah, that's a really good answer. So. How can authors best leverage publicity to build their platform? Um, okay, the, the way that I generally describe an author's platform is in four parts. So the first part is the website. So this is your central hub. This is your home base. And everything kind of points out in, you know, points toward the home base and, the, and everything is sort of connected out from the, you know, it's the hub of everything you do online. The second thing is your authority content. So this is content that you create, like a blog or a podcast, if you do videos, any, any, and your books, anything that you create that shows that you know what you're talking about. And then the third thing would be community outreach, and that's going to be like your email, you know, emails to your list, social media, so messages that you post. So all of the things I've described to this point is essentially content marketing. So it is you are creating content to position yourself, demonstrate your authority, and and most of it only reaches people that you, you know, within arm's reach, people that you yourself can reach. Your, the number of people who are on your list already, the number of people who follow you on social media already. Publicity is then taking going to that next step and you're going to an influencer who has an audience so instead of you talking as a stranger to this group of people and they they don't know who you are they don't know if they can trust you they don't care you're going to somebody that has built equity with that audience they have built trust they have done all the heavy lifting so that when they say hey here's something i think you would find interesting well the audience already trusts this person you know, this this goes back to you know what we call the Oprah effect. When Oprah and her, you know, I mean, Oprah of course is still very powerful, very famous, but really, with the when you think about the the pinnacle of when she was popular, it was as simple as the fact that you were on the show means you are endorsed by Oprah. That that's completely different than you're in front of those people and they don't know who you are. So, and another way that I think of it is also I'll I'll often explain describe it as if you went to a coffee shop and you walk up to a stranger and start talking about yourself, they probably will not appreciate being interrupted. But if somebody says, hey, I'm a friend of that person, let me introduce you. So now this person takes you to that table and says, let me introduce you to a friend of mine. That's what publicity does. Publicity is somebody saying, let me introduce you to a friend of mine, which completely changes how you look to that audience. So at that point, now you are talking to an audience that is bigger than you can reach on your own. And some of those people now will come over and become part of your ecosystem. Some of those people will become part of your followers on social media. Some of them will sign up for your email. Some of them will um, start reading your blog or listening to your podcast. Some of them will start visiting your website. And so when you are in, you know, when you use publicity to find those new people, you are leveraging their platform to build your platform. So it, what we're doing right now, I mean, this is publicity. You have an audience. And so people that have possibly never heard of me are hearing of me and seeing me and hearing me for the first time. And if I had just stood up on an apple crate somewhere, maybe they would listen. 
you know, or maybe they would say, well, I don't know who this is. But because you and I are having this conversation, we'll see some of, I'm leveraging your platform. You, you People trust you, and now they're listening to me. And so somebody, either at the live broadcast or watching the replay, will will come and sign up for my email list or come and follow me on Facebook or will read my blog or, or something. And so there will be now more people in my ecosystem as a direct result of this conversation right now. And this happens every time, you know, when I speak at a conference, you know, an online conference, an in-person conference, when I'm a guest on a blog, when I write a guest post. Every time that happens, uh, new people end up in my ecosystem, and I'm being introduced, I'm meeting new people all the time, and most of those people came from somebody else's platform. Right, and... And that can be why it's so important and so powerful to do guest blog posts. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm I'm a regular guest blogger, or actually, uh, more specifically, a contributing writer to Joel Friedlander's blog, The Book mm -hmm. Designer. And so he has this huge audience, and I write blog posts every week, I mean every month. And so that gives me an audience I wouldn't otherwise have. Right. So if you were to write a blog post for anybody who has an audience or be a guest on a podcast of anyone who has an audience, you will, you will extend your, you will extend your, um, what's the word I'm trying to think of? You extend your platform to those people. Right. You'll build your platform with those people. You will right. get, get to be exposed to new people, and that's why it's so powerful to do those things. Yeah, when people dismiss the idea of media coverage, I, I think a lot of times it's because they think of a very narrow definition. They're thinking, I could never be on the Today Show, so therefore there's no reason to bother when, you know, being a guest, on a, so like if I, like I wrote, I wrote a blog post for your blog, and so while I, I wrote it, I did the work, I still also got all the benefits out of it as if, you know, you had interviewed me because I'm, you know, I'm in front of your audience, I'm endorsed by you, it's it's not an overt endorsement, but the fact is you thought it was worth posting or you wouldn't have posted it, and so, yes, brand new people were introduced to me as a result of that post. You know, I recently had a post on uh, BookWorks. Um, I was, you know, I recently uh, was one of the panelists uh, with for Indie Author Fringe. So, you know, every time one of these things happens, that's still media. That's still being put in front of an audience. It doesn't have to be the Today Show to be media. Right. And and a lot of times, you know, one of the reasons that I often teach, you know, don't don't put all your energy into the big thing because even even if it pays off, you don't know that your audience is going to be watching that. When you go for local, when you go for small, when you go for niche, you're way more likely to get in front of the right people who will be interested enough to follow up with you. Right. And that and that's true, you know, and that's true of anyone that has an audience. And so this publicity process is really about who has an audience and how can I serve that audience so that some of them will say, I like what he said or I like what she said and then follow up with you and then come back to that ecosystem we talked about where they're looking at your authority content or they are become part of your community or they visit your website. So what success have you had at garnering media attention? Uh, well, over the years, I mean, I've been interviewed by newspapers, magazines, I've been on podcasts, I've been on television. Uh, with this brand that I am developing now, Build Your Brand Academy, uh, which is relatively new. Uh, I actually am cataloging on the site a lot of the opportunities that I've had in the media. So if you go to my media page, I have all of my media materials, but then there's also a list and links so that you can go through and see, okay, here are blogs that interviewed me uh, or a podcast or here's conferences that I spoke at. And so uh, it's just been a lot of different kinds of things. And cool. you know, and 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 every every media opportunity leads to more. So that's the other reason not to th dismiss something because it seems too small or not flashy enough. Is you don't know who's in that audience and will then say, "Hey, I really liked this. Could you be in my event? Could you be part of my conference? Can you 
guest on my blog. So you, you don't know who's in the audience that will be interested and then also further your reach to new audiences. Great. I'm trying not to cough here. Um, what should just, a media just let it go. authors include? I'm sorry, I was saying a smart look remark and I didn't hear your question. Um, I am going to cough, excuse me. Okay. <coughs> what should a media kit for authors include? Oh, uh, okay, a media kit. The reason you want a media kit is because when somebody comes to your site, they, if they are brand new, they want to know more about you, but they also want to know practical information. So the thing about a media kit is it, it narrows the information so that it's easy for them to find, easy for them to get what they need, easy for them to learn what they need to know about you, whether this is an event planner, maybe it's a bookseller, maybe it's a library, you know, or a new reader even that really just wants to know more about you before they invest the time in you. But then, of course, the media. If the media is going to consider you for an interview, this is the kind of stuff they're going to be looking for because they're either they're, they're trying to determine whether you would be a good guest in, or you know, a good subject for the media, or they are researching for that interview. Uh, like, in fact, as we were getting ready for this, you went to my website and you were looking at things so that we could have this conversation. Uh, another reason that you would want media materials is that maybe you're going to have you're going to have some materials that they could just grab and just use. And so many times over the years, if all I needed was a quote or a blurb or a quick piece of information about an author, I don't have to. I don't have to call anyone to get that. It should be right there so that I can just grab it and use it and help them be more famous. I mean, that's what they want. So the kinds of things that you want to perform these functions, you need information about yourself as an author, information about your book, and then you need two images. You need an author photo and a book cover. When I say author information, we need, uh, and, and you know, I have a whole course on this, so we could talk about this for a long time, but in a nutshell, the information about you as an author really needs to zero in on who you are as an author, why you write what you write, what qualifies you, whether it's job experience, life experience, whatever that is, and, and it's fair. If you write fiction and you just love mysteries and that's why you write mysteries, that's fair. That is a fair thing to say, this is why I write mysteries because it still explains why you write mysteries. So you're not going to have a lot of information about pets or where you graduated if it's not relevant to the kinds of things that you write. Information about your book would be if, if you are pushing a particular book, if this is the thing that you're hoping will come up in the course of this interview or spotlight or whatever, then you need to have clear, crisp information. This is what it is. This is what it's about. Here's where people can get it. And, and it needs to be um, just it needs to be very short so that it's easy to skim and and the author information and the book information it's it's important to understand that this person who's looking at it is probably in a hurry just has a number of seconds to determine if you have what they need before they will give up so you want to get right to the point on your website you are free to have more general kinds of things, more touchy-feely kinds of things. You're, it's fine if you want to have a letter to readers somewhere on your site. I'm not saying don't do that, but that's not your media kit. You need to have, is that you or is that me? I think it's, okay. Um, you want, uh, where was I, author, author information. You want people to uh, go right to this is what this author is about. And then the picture needs to be a, a headshot that is like a basic headshot. You don't have a funny hat. You don't have your hands on your face. You're not smoking a pipe. You're not holding a typewriter or a prop. It needs to be, and it also needs to be room around your head so they can crop into different shapes. Mm. Because the, med the media will, a lot of times, there's some set size that the box is supposed to be. 
that you're going, they're going to put your picture in, and some, for some of them it needs to be a rectangle, or and a rectangle up and down, for some of them a rectangle that's wide, for some of them a square, and so if you put up a picture of yourself that is some very, you know, you cut right to here, and I've got to put up a square, and this has happened where I've, I was at a media outlet, and we do squares, and they did something that was real tight, and so we had to cut into the forehead and into the chin to make it a square, because that's what they did to us. So you want a picture that has enough room that the media can choose the shape that that photo is supposed to be and doesn't have other people in it that they have to figure out how to crop out that person or crop out that prop. It's just, just you looking at the camera, basic headshot. And, and then the book cover needs to be just a basic flat book cover, you know, no, not 3D, no halo effect, no, you know, filtering, nothing special or fancy. Now, again, on your website, you can have fun photos. You can have a photo of you on a trip or with family or pets or whatever. You can have a book cover that you did some kind of fancy 3D effect. That's fine on your site. That is not fine in your media materials. The media materials need to be practical, simple, plain, to the point, so that the media can... They are the ones that will dress it up. They are the ones that will put it wherever it needs to go. And anything that you do to dress it up like that, they have to figure out how to undo that. And sometimes it can't be done, and then they crop it horribly or can't use it. You know, So you want information that is practical, to the point, easy to find, easy to use, easy to grab and go. That was really good. That's a really good explanation. Thank you. Um, what should every author, let me see, should every author have a press area on their website? I've gone back and forth on this for myself. Uh, I, I would say it helps. Um, the, like in my case, I use the same page for my media materials and also my, and I assume you mean press, like this is the press that I have gotten, right? Is that what you mean? Well, the, the press area with, with, with news, published news stories, um, the picture, um, press releases. Right, you're, yes. You're thinking of, and then also a compilation of past press covering. Yes. Yeah I, I, yeah, I use my media page for both of those functions. I have, like, all of the media kinds of things that I described. Now, I don't currently have a book, so I don't have book information, but I have here's who I am, if you're going to talk to me, here are some key points, here are some suggested interview questions, here's, you know, here are different bios, here's a picture, and, but then also on that page, here are appearances I've had in the media, and if you can do that, I think it's very important to have a portfolio that you're building on your website, because the same person that wants to see your media materials that you created also they will be more comfortable with you as a guest if they see that others have vetted you. Because now it comes back to that idea of the endorsement. Oh, this person was in the newspaper. This person was on a podcast. And if, especially if I can click through and read the article, if I can, you know, if there's an embedded file or I can click through and listen to the podcast, then I know how you sound on, on the mic. Or if there's a video, I can see how you are on camera. I can see if you're comfortable or if you're kind of awkward. You know, these are all of anything that you can post that makes me feel more comfortable about having you as a guest in my media. And so, so you don't have to put everything that happens. I've had students ask me about this. You don't have to put every, like if there's something that happens and you're like, I really don't like how that story turned out, you don't have to include that. But anything you conclude that says, this is where I have appeared, this is what I have done, and especially if I can click through, I can either look at a screen capture or click a link, or if you can embed a file so I can just play it right there, anything that helps me see that you are endorsed by other media, which makes my job, it makes the choice easier if others have already chosen you. And also anything that demonstrates how you handle yourself in an interview or a media situation. Those are really good points. I hadn't thought about that, that um, a past experience would demonstrate how you would be on camera mm -hmm. in the future. Mm -hmm. That's really good to know. How can an indie author today be newsworthy? 
Uh, I think we alluded to it earlier uh, with your right. example of the romance author. Right. You, the, first, the first thing is you don't focus on yourself. You don't focus on your book. And this is the mistake that a lot of authors make is they, they think this is why I'm newsworthy is I have a book when in fact, uh, well, for example, today, I read in the news today that today 500, more than 500 books were released today. That doesn't count the hundreds that came out earlier in the week or last week or last month, the thousands over the years, the millions of books that exist. It doesn't count the hundreds that are coming. So when you say, I have a book, well, you know, get in line. Um, depending on where you live, if it's local media, okay, maybe that is newsworthy, but that's like one of the few cases. But most of the time, what you want to do is pitch something that is a topic that will be of interest to the audience. Uh, think about when you are in the grocery store, the cover lines on the magazines that are in the rack when you're ready to check out. Those cover lines are almost never, here's a person with the product and that's all we're going to tell you. Usually it's, this person is going to talk on this topic. And even if it's a celebrity, even if it's somebody with a movie, it will still be, this movie star talking about his special diet. This per, you know, this famous person did this thing, and so the reason sure. you want, the reason you want to flip, the reason you're going to grab that magazine and flip to it is not person exists as a product. It's topic, some kind of topic, some intriguing topic. So, you know, think of a magazine cover line when you think of what am I going to pitch to this media outlet, or I also refer to it as the TV talk show test. When you watch a show, or you know whether it's a radio or TV show, and they have segments, when they promote an upcoming segment, it's almost never person as a product. It's coming up, this topic, 30 ways to make more money or to be healthier or whatever. So you need to have a topic that is like a topic that they will say, coming up next. You know, so imagine your topic Will that work in that context coming up next, or will it work as a cover line in a magazine? Because in you know you're you're not a celebrity probably. So if you're not a celebrity, your name means nothing to these people, and your book means nothing to these people. But if you can talk about a topic that this audience will be interested in, the media wants to know it because their their goal is to keep the audience engaged, or they will be out of a job. So if you can come to the media and say, I have a topic that is your audience will be interested in, the media wants to know about that because it will help them do their jobs. And it will also open way more doors for you than saying, I have a book. And so the, you know, and so there's a list of ways to be newsworthy. Like there's a specific list. And I foolishly don't have that list in front of me, but it, it includes uh, like there's timeliness. So so if you have a topic that is connected to what's going on in the news now or the media, um, human interest is where you're able to put a human face on a story that otherwise would be sort of abstract. So when we think about recent, um, recent disasters that have happened in the world, the human interest story is when the media goes beyond the thing that happened and says, here's a story of a person that can humanize this story to, to help you empathize better with the people going through this. So that's a human interest story. So if you can pitch a story where you are putting a face on an idea or a topic that, that is an interesting issue. So those are the kinds of things, you know, so if, whether you write, so even if you write fiction, then you just look for nonfiction topics that connect to the, whatever is going on in your book. Uh, or if you're a poet, whether, you know, your poems are about something, pitch the something, and then they'll say, who's talking about this topic? This person with this book. And of course, if you're a nonfiction author, usually it's pretty easy to figure out what the topics are. Yeah, I was going to ask you, isn't it easier for a nonfiction author to, to get media attention? It's easier, uh, but by the same token, I mean, it really comes down to, can you come up with a topic that that audience cares about? And so, you know, if you wrote, a nonfiction book that the the surface topic is of no interest to that audience, you might still have to do the job of figuring out, okay, what is the thing that is connected to this book? And so you don't lead with the book. You have the book sort of being is sort of hitched at the back so that like I'm here to talk about this. 
and then when they say, well, who's, who is this person? This person's the author of this book. This person, you know, author of this recent book, here's this topic. And so you still have to do, you go to, you know, do the due diligence of saying, who is this audience? What are they interested in? What can I do to serve that audience so that when I go to the media, I can say, I will help you keep your audience in, you know, tuned in, keep them reading, whatever, because of this topic. And so if you're able, especially if you're able to connect to um, issue, you know, health, relationships, finances, you know, so like in your example, I mean, a lot of your books are about social media. Well, there are some audiences that maybe they don't care, but you could say, but if you talked about social media as it relates to your children, some audiences, that's the thing that makes it interesting to them. Or social media as it relates to your finances, social media as it relates to your health, now you're finding different topics that are different points of entry to bring people into, well, I'm, I'm the expert. I have this book, and I'm going to talk about your relationship with your children in the context of social media because I'm a social media expert. Right. There was somebody locally who wrote a social media book about cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the local media felt that that was an important topic. And because she had this book, mm -hmm. her book was actually her, her entry point to the media coverage. Right. But, but even, I would say even, you know, if it's social media related to cybersecurity, even though you did not write about cybersecurity, if you can speak into that, you can, that's still fair game for you to pitch yourself to media as, you know, if, there, if there's any topic in the news that you're like, oh, I can speak to that from a social media perspective as a social media expert. Any topic is fair game. Right, right, right. Um, we've kind of talked about how an author can be newsworthy today. Mm -hmm. So um, what are three actionable ways that authors can get started on their own publicity now? Generally, I recommend... Um, Start local, start small, start building your platform. So, or I'm sorry, start building your portfolio. So uh, when you start local, one of the things about local media is, you know, it's well, depending on where you live, uh, it's, you know, it's smaller, it's easier to get into. Being a local person means they're kind of pulling for you. They're looking for an opportunity to talk about local people that are doing things. So you still want to try and come up with an interesting topic but they're so much more welcoming if they're local media than if you're going to go right out to the you know something big. And in local media, as we said earlier, that's one of the few places where if you're you, if you're stumped for a topic, local media is one of the few places where maybe it will still work to say I have a book. Uh, but when you say start small, we talked earlier about like you know small media, niche media. If you can find media that is more zeroed, they, they zero in on your topic of interest. So going back to your example of the romance author, if one of the first, you know, if you're starting out as a romance author, look for places that talk to romance authors and, and they're just that audience. It might be a blog. It might just have an audience of a few hundred people. It might be a newsletter. It might be, you know, a podcast. It's small, but it's also that audience is way more engaged and way more likely to be interested in you specifically and want to follow up with you. And then the great thing about local media and small media, if you start out there, is it gives you a chance to practice being in the media. It gives you an opportunity to get accustomed and warm up to the idea of being on camera, being on a microphone. Um, or just even answering questions, you know, uh, and a lot of times you might, uh, for a lot of media, especially text type kind of media, um, if you start out with like a blog or a newspaper or a magazine, it's very likely your interview will just be email, answering email questions, which is very low pressure. So all the more so if it's like a romance newsletter, romance magazine, they'll probably just email you some questions and that's a real low pressure way to get started. And then if you start your portfolio, this comes back to the press page we talked about. Start cataloging these appearances because then you can say as, as new people learn about you, 
they will see that I was in that magazine, I was in that newsletter, I was on that show, and sometimes you'll just be able to mention it. Like if you're on the local news, maybe there's video online that you could link to or embed on your site, or you may just have to say, this is a thing that happened, but which is, you know, if that's all you can do, that's fine, it's still worth adding, but if you're able to link to something or show a screen capture, you know, if you're in a print magazine, you know, you, you can scan in a page and do, a, you know, just show, show a picture of you being in the newsletter or in the, being in the newspaper or magazine. And so the more that you can say, you know, the more that you do these small things, you're working your way up to bigger things because you're also able to catalog and demonstrate and practice being a guest and then, again, you don't know who's in the audience that will then say, that was pretty good, I want you on my blog or my podcast, and then you don't know who's in that audience that will say, come be on my show. So all, all this media leads to more media, especially if you put it on your website so that people can see it, you can point to it, you can talk about it, it gives you something to talk about with your email list, it gives you something, without saying, look at me, I'm great, you can say, I was interviewed and this is what we talked about. So now the focus is on this is what we talked about. So it's a way to indirectly say, here's me talking about myself, which, you know, that way you, you can still say, you can still talk about yourself, but at least now it, the, because the spotlight is over there, it looks less self-serving. And it, you know, and it looks way better on social media if instead of saying, buy my book, buy my book, you're like, hey, Here's a conversation that I had on this topic. You know, it's way more interesting. Oh, yeah, so, definitely more interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that was a really good answer. So who are the best members of the media for authors to contact? Uh, that is going to change from media outlet to media outlet. You, What you would do... Well, you start with who is the audience, and once, and so as long as you know the audience, then you look for the media that's talking to that audience. And so, depending on the first answer, that will change the second answer. Who, what is the media? So, what is it a podcast? Is it a newsletter? A newspaper? A magazine? Etc. And then, and then you figure out who are the decision makers. And so, you look for a staff box if it's a print publication, or you know, might be on the website or you listen to the credits at the end of that podcast, or you watch the credits at the end of that video or that TV show. And look for words like um, department editor, um, uh, segment producer. If it's a smaller outlet, if it's like a podcast and there aren't a lot of names involved in the production, then maybe you talk to the host directly. If it's a larger outlet, if it's like a media outlet with a lot of staff, well then that's when you're more likely to have to figure out, well, who who is the handler? Who is the person that this information goes through? And so when in doubt, you can just call the front desk. And so if there's a contact window on the website, if there's a you know a phone number for the front desk, if there's a, an email that's like info at email, and just ask, who do I pitch to? You know, this will not be your pitch. You don't pitch cold because you, because ultimately the real answer is you want the name of a specific person and whether that person is the host or the reporter or you actually need to go through like an editor, but maybe it's a columnist, you know, maybe it's a podcaster, whoever it is, you want a pitch where you are saying, hello, specific person, I have this topic that I think your audience would be interested in. And so the more that it's like a real conversation, the more that I, like if you're pitching me, the more that I feel like you are talking to a real person instead of some impersonal cookie cutter thing, the more I'm going to pay attention, the more I'm going to care. Um, and maybe you're not a good fit, or maybe we disagree about whether you're a good fit, but you have a way better chance if I believe that you are a, you and I are having a real conversation it completely changes your opportunity if I believe it's a real conversation. Right, and, and I mean, not a manufactured conversation. Right, and I would, I would say, you know, coming from the years that I worked in music journalism, there was a publicist who figured out that if she 
brought her band to the office to play for us in the office, it it made it a lot more difficult not to cover them because now they're people. It's easy to dismiss somebody that's just, mm -hmm. oh, you're just part of a stack of papers or you're just part of a stack of CDs. Okay, now I've met you. Now I've looked you in the eye. Now, you know, it's it's sort of like that, um, you know, it's like you've got to adopt. I've looked at that puppy. Now I have to adopt it kind of feeling. It's like I've, I've met you. That's <laughs> I, I can't just kick you to the curb now because I've met you. And so now it's a harder decision to not cover you so the more that you can kind of tap into that idea of, you know, you're networking, you're building a relationship, you're talking. Like you mentioned earlier, we met on Twitter. We talked on Twitter a lot before we got to the point where I did a blog post for your website. And then in the, I, don't, I, I can't think how much time has passed since we met but between then and now. So all of that kind of stuff that is, you know, as, as long as you, as long as you, talking now to the person trying to get the media coverage, as long as you are thinking kind of long term and you are building actual relationships, then when you get to that point where you say, hey, I have something for your audience, I as the media feel less like you're just trying to huckster me. I feel like you have something legitimate and that you've thought about this and we are having an actual conversation. Maybe you're not, I mean, you may still not get in. Because maybe I still I can't fit you for some reason. Maybe there's no room at this time. But you have a way better chance if it's a real conversation with a person that I have, you know, I've had some interaction with. What do you think about contacting reporters via the uh, social media? It's okay to engage with them. You would not pitch to them. So you would like you might develop a, a kind of passing relationship with them. Um, like, okay, coming back to the example of, of you and me on Twitter, uh, I'm pretty sure that when we actually got to the point where we talked about my guest post on your website, that when we were an email at that point. Right. So there's, hi, I exist. I'm commenting on something that you're doing. We, you know who I am. And then when I say, hey, how do I pitch you? This person will then say, uh, you know, you can send an email, you can call, whatever their preference is. And different people have different preferences. But most of the time, it's going to be email me, I think, for most people. And, um, and so, so the social media, you are meeting them. You are finding a way. You're, you're getting the information that you need to make the pitch, but that's not going to be the pitch. All right. All right. So... What should be in an author's pitch to the media? Uh, okay, it needs to be short and to the point, but it also needs to be complete. It needs to be, you know, well, first of all, you know, somewhere in the greeting, you have to convince me that this is a real conversation. So you're going to talk to me by name. You're going to spell my name correctly. You're, you might say something about... The website or whatever it is that I whatever it is I as the media do but you know you don't lay it on too thick you don't go into an essay and you don't lie because you'll probably get it wrong and then I'll know that you because you know, this has happened where people will pitch me something that is like we don't do that they'll say hey I was you know I love your magazine I hope you would do this thing that you've never done ever and don't have a place for that thing to go and immediately you know, and maybe they have read the magazine and they were just, it was just a stupid pitch, but I immediately assume they have never actually seen the magazine. So you want your pitch to be real person, correct name, and if you say anything about the media outlet, it needs to be correct. And if you just say, I, you know, I noticed that you cover this kind of topic or that this is something that has come up before, you know, any clue that you know who I am and what I do. Mm -hmm. But it, again, be brief. You know, it needs to be like a, like a sentence or less. And then you go right into, this is something that your audience would be interested in, and here's the topic, and this is why your audience would be interested. And so again, it's not, I have a book, it's not, I exist, it is, here is a, a topic of discussion. And so depending on what you're pitching, 
and depending on what they do, I mean, let's assume that it's, the, I mean, the simplest thing to assume is that we're talking about an interview. Here's a topic of discussion. Here's an interview topic. You know, this is what I think we could talk about. This is who I am. Here's a link to more information if you would like to look at my press kit or the press release or whatever. Here's how to follow up. You know, here's who I am. Here's how to follow up. And then we're talking about like a like five lines probably, and you don't want to go on and on because if you don't want me to have to dig through this to figure out what you're trying to say, but you also don't want to be so vague that I don't know what you're talking about. It needs to be I know exactly what you're talking about, and you got there quickly and to the point, and you piqued my interest because you want me to follow up. You want me to reply or go look at your press materials or something. Great, great. And what are the most common mistakes that authors make when contacting members of the media? Uh, common mistakes. Uh, well, we kind of, I think, touched on some of them. Yeah. Like they'll say the, they'll they'll not know who the name is, or say I don't know who I'm supposed to contact. When right. you know clearly it's it's right there in the staff box who the editor is or who I you know like who I am, what I do is right there in the staff box. So that tells me you don't read the magazine. Um, just just being focusing on the wrong thing, talking you know, thinking that you are the news story or thinking that your book is the news story. I'm not saying that will never happen, but that will rarely, it will almost never happen. It's easier to assume that it is just that's not the way to go. Um, and uh, so either not enough information because they're trying to be coy, and then I'm like, I don't have time to figure out why this is interesting. Mm -hmm. And I just move on to the next thing. Or they just give me way too much information. So whether it's an email with just way too much stuff, and, I have, and, and I'm expected to dig through and figure out what's newsworthy. Or if it's a kit that comes in the mail, and it's just a giant folder, and it's just full of things, and I'm supposed to sort through it and figure out what's interesting, interesting about this. Um, I had a publicist once, and, and it's weird that this happened because this publicist is like one of the best publicists I've ever worked with. But he... One time he pitched, a, this is back to music journalism again, he pitched an artist that he wanted in my magazine, but didn't give me like an entry point, didn't give me anything like why Why should this artist, you know, give me some idea of what the feature would be, and he was like, well, that's your job, and it's like, well, actually, no, it's not my job to figure out why you're newsworthy, it's your job to tell me why I should care, because I, you know, no matter who you're pitching to, they have lots of choices. So you you want to stand out above all the other choices. So the more that you are to the point, the more that you don't take a lot of their time, but the more but the more that what you say, you know, they can figure out quickly what you're talking about and you give them enough context and you and if you just go to that simple step of here's a topic of interest that your audience will care about so many people do that wrong that that alone will put you ahead of so many people it doesn't guarantee that you will get in that outlet because there there are a lot of other factors involved but it 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 gives you a significantly higher um, uh, chance of being taken seriously fabulous Wow, you've answered all my questions, and mm -hmm. we have a very, we have a dedicated group today. They stayed with us the entire time, but they've been okay. a very quiet group. Mm -hmm. So I just, I run out of questions, and I just want to thank you, Chris, <laughs> so much for being on the show today. And I appreciate it. I want to thank everyone else who tuned in. I, I love doing these. I'm happy that you all show up, and just as a reminder, I'm Frances Caballo with Social Media Just for Writers.com. And Chris, do you want to say how people can contact you? Uh, well, they can look for me at buildyourbrandacademy.com. I'm on Twitter at buildyourbranda. Uh, I'm on Facebook. I have a Facebook group. So those are the primary ways to find me. Oh, and I'm on Instagram. That's new. I'm, I'm still figuring out Instagram. So <laughs> uh, come visit me there. Yeah. And do you have a, a free email course or something that you want to tell people, people about? Oh, uh, I I guess I do. I I wasn't pre prepared for this, or I would have a URL. Uh, I do. Oh, if you okay, if you go to buildyourbrandacademy.com, there is a hello bar that will pop up at the top. There is a 
free five-day course that will actually walk you through the five steps of crafting the email we just talked about. So it literally is, these are the five steps to creating your email that says, this is who I am, this is what I'm pitching to a specific person. And so if you go to my, if you go to buildyourbrandacademy.com, um, you sh it should be very easy to find a link somewhere to register for this. And it's, a, it's five days, it's five emails, there are videos that go with it if you want to watch the videos or if you just want to read the email lessons. And each day you just do a little thing that at the end of the week you have an email that you could send to somebody if you were ready to do that. Fabulous. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for being here, and I'm going to sign off. Take care, everyone. Thank you.